the soul music of rhythm and blues. America's number one luxury car. Hello and welcome to our show. I'm Sheila Grant and I'll be your host and kind of like a tour guide. Now, if you're someone who loves Detroit like I do, then produced in the D is the place to be. First, let me explain what I mean when I say produced in the D. The cheers that still echo through downtown Detroit where crowds of fans celebrated the Tigers, Pistons, and Red Wings championship wins. Well, we'll go back to reminisce on some of those priceless memories produced in the D. Maybe this is the year we can also celebrate a Super Bowl victory with the Lions. <laughs> that could happen. Does anyone remember seeing our very own Jerome Bettis win Super Bowl XL at home in Detroit? I'm still proud, and we've had great players like Lim Barney, Mel Farr, and of course, the running of Barry Sanders was just incredible. Sanders is gone. Like many of you, even in the coldest winters here in Detroit, I have never missed going to the Thanksgiving parade to see Santa or Cobo Hall to see the newest cars at the auto show. And I still have that burn mark on the side of my leg that I got from falling on Belau's giant slide one hot summer. Yes, sadly, even my burn mark produced in the D. We'll hear from other Detroiters throughout this series on what they know about what's produced in the D. Join us as we get together to take a look at some of the things that have made this city so great. There's only one problem. Where do we start? There are so many amazing things that symbolize who we are and what we've offered to the world. From classic cars to hit songs, legends in sports, music, and innovations. Really, the list goes on and on. Let's start by taking a look at the reason Detroit is also known to the world as the Motor City. Ford practiced what he preached. Through his own fierce determination, he had risen from obscurity to become one of the most famous and powerful men in the country. With the Model T, the most successful car in history, and the groundbreaking $5 a day wage, Ford ushered in the modern world. Henry Ford's story always inspired me, hearing how he just kept going uh, until he succeeded through various failures. Um, he just kept kept going and then, you know, he came up with the assembly line and, and the rest is history. I did a book report on him in like the third grade. He was a pioneer. He, you know, he made the, the assembly line. So, I mean, that was, that was major. I mean, he's like the creator of, you know, the auto industry pretty much. Everything is named after him. <laughs> he has been probably the biggest influence that Detroit has seen, you know, in regards to the fact that we are still the Motor City, in regards to how popular he is, you know, and just how influential his his name and legacy have been. He's, like, uh, ingrained into Detroit's history. Back in 1914, Ford had revolutionized assembly line production, and to keep his workers from quitting, he announced he would raise their pay to a generous $5 a day twice what they earned before, and twice what they could earn at any other auto company. It was a simple American bargain, security and high wages in exchange for hard work. He kind of coined that term like Fordism, which was high pay, high pay salary, high pay wages, and um, mass production of, of an inexpensive products. I remember seeing footage of just crowds of people, I mean like a sea of people working in plants, um, and yeah, Henry Ford, you know, got that going. I just think it was cool that he brought a lot of jobs, especially for, you know, black people here in Detroit. You know, just giving people a chance, you know, really being the pioneer of the good plant jobs. They came to Detroit in hopes of a life they could find nowhere else. Ford workers enjoyed company picnics, could live in company housing, 
and even buy the Ford cars they produced. High wages paid off in high production and high profits for the company. Detroit was booming. I mean, it was pretty obvious. You had people here making money like they had never had before. Um, and I think they were, you know, writing to the family members uh, that weren't in Detroit, whether it was, you know, down south, from down south with the Great Migration, or they might have even been coming from other countries. Uh, they were writing them saying, you know, how great things are in Detroit. You know, they were able to get new houses, new cars, things they'd never had before. Detroit started booming when uh, Henry Ford came and brought the automobile, basically. And then you had like part of the great migration where African Americans um, moved to Detroit from the South. And they came here because they wanted better opportunities. And um, that kind of built the population. So yeah, um, Detroit was the place to be. It was like the move to do, you know, that was the move, go work at Ford. This is where you came the money up. You needed the money up, you came to Detroit. And you could build, you could come here, you could money up, and then you could build something on your own. And so that was, that gave Detroit, I think that's what gave us that swag. I mean, we had opportunities available to us. And, and, and if you were willing to work hard, sky was the limit. For my own personal family, um, that's the reason we probably in Detroit today because, you know, we had to escape everything that was going down you know, in the South, and we came up here for jobs and opportunities, and I mean, had my family not did that, I probably wouldn't be here today. It definitely was booming. Downtown was being built, new buildings, you know, inspire other entrepreneurs. Um, um, architects from all over the world were coming here to, to build. People think a lot about the car industry and what it did for people with jobs and stuff like that, but I mean, here, everybody won because Everybody had jobs, everybody had money to spend, so I think it was a really good time to be a business owner then, too. In great waves of migration from Europe and the American South, the hopeful had found their way to Detroit's thriving ethnic neighborhoods. They had been Ukrainian peasants and Alabama sharecroppers. Now they were auto workers, 50,000 strong at Ford's River Rouge factory the largest industrial complex in history. Here was a strange new world. Thundering forges, the huge foundry and powerhouse, the endless miles of assembly line. They called it the Cathedral of Industry. And here, like clockwork, they made four cars every minute. 240 an hour, 6,000 Fords a day. Growing up, you know, everybody talked about getting a plant job, working at, you know, Chrysler or Ford or something like that and making the car. You know, it's just like, that's like a common thing to hear in the city. You know, it's, it's very common to hear, oh yeah, my, my granddad or, you know, my dad worked at Ford back in the day, worked at Ford. It's like, it's not, that's very common. You know, every, it seemed like, you know, uh, six or seven out of ten people you know, that you could, you know, point to in a generation on the street. You, you, you have family that worked at four, you work at four back in the day, yeah, yeah. If you going straight out of high school, 18 years old, you making 50K, making cars. So it was just the norm for people. It was either you go to college or you go get a job at Ford or Chrysler. I listened to stories from my grandmother. She got up here, I believe, in 1942. And what she always tells me is that it was amazing to be here. It was such a different feel from the South. Like you just felt hopeful, you were motivated. There were so many different opportunities. And once your family members were able to work for, let's say Ford in the plant, then you just had endless opportunities at your grasp. Even Barry Gordy, if I'm not mistaken, he worked at the, the Ford plants before. And he basically ran Motown as if it was an assembly line. <laughs> Business was booming, cars were being bought, and you had the big bands, you had the dance hall. Everything was going great. The plant workers was the rappers back then, you know. Everybody wanted to be flossy, you know, everybody, oh, look what he got, look what Junebug brought back, look what kind of car he driving, he made that car. As far as lifestyle goes, people, you know, the plant always 
you know, pay high wage. So most people that worked in the plant in any capacity had money, you know, significant amount of money. So now you, you had disposable income. You could, you could buy a house, you didn't have to rent. You know, you could buy, you had a new car. I mean, you know, your kids were dressed nice and they didn't have to wear hand-me-downs, you know. I, I mean, I, I hated my, my uh, friends in school whose parents worked at the plants because they was fresh. They always had everything, you know. And if your parent worked anywhere else, you know, you, you probably wasn't so lucky. I know my grandma, when my grandpa was working at the plant, like, she had furs, she had diamonds. I'm like, all from a plant job. It's that new money. You like, I don't know what to do. Let me go hit up Dietrichs. I remember like talking to my uncles and stuff. They all had jobs when they were at the plants, like at 18, and they were driving brand new cars, um, deuce in the quarters and cutlasses and Cadillacs. So I think it meant a lot. And uh, I have a lot of um, family members who worked for Ford, actually, um, and GM. And you know, they, they live good lives, they retired. Um, sent their kids off to college, and even some of them started working when they were 18. Like, I have a cousin who's been there since she was 18, and she's about to retire at, like, 50. It was what you would expect, what people now expect is supposed to happen when you graduate from college. Like, you get a job, and, you know, and everything is working out immediately. Like, I, all right, I, got, I went to school, got my job, I'm at four, and, I'm, and everything is popping. I'm married, got my family, everybody is done. You, you're doing all that young because you got a good job, you're stable. Whenever you tell someone that you work for the plan or you work at the plan or for Ford, they're always like, oh, you got money, you cashy, you know. So it's kind of that thing where you're very proud of what you do because you can get nice things to show that you are a hard worker. My grandfather worked at Ford, um, and I remember hearing about how major that was, how everyone looked up to him. He was one of the first black skilled trade workers at Ford, and this is back in the 30s. My grandparents got married in 1936, and he had a, a 36 Ford coupe with a convertible, uh, with the rumble seat, the seat that let down in the back, and you know, they said he was like a star. You know, uh, people looked up to that. He bought the house I grew up in uh, off the East Ground Boulevard, a two-family brick house. He had a house in New York uh, and rented one of, one of them out. So, you know, my family was doing well then. I think they even said their house was in uh, a issue of better homes and garden. I remember my grandmother always saying that. <laughs> There were Chevys, Packards, and Mercedes, but half the cars in the world were Model T Fords. Simple, cheap, and sturdy. The most widely used vehicle in human history. Wow, Henry Ford really got those cars rolling off the assembly line, and that put Detroit on the map over 100 years ago. But ever since then, Detroit has been putting out one classic after another. Let's go back through the years and see some of those amazing machines produced in the D. In the 50s, Americans never had it so good. A giddy decade of excess and the arrogance of wealth, an era of conspicuous consumption and state-of-the-art gadgets. In 1956, Elvis had five number ones in a row and the rest of the music wasn't bad either. Cars were as excessive as everything else, and gas was just 15 cents a gallon. The American automobile was escapism on wheels. Firebird 2 to control tower. We are about to take off on the highway of tomorrow. When you, like, growing up, that's, that was like one of the number one things to have, is just to have a car, you know, fresh out of high school or in high school at least, you know, so. One of my favorite cars that always stuck out to me was, it was probably like my second or third car, is my Cutlass Olds. I mean, I loved it. It was the first car I ever changed my own transmission in it, and that, that was a job, but, you know, i never forget those big seats. You know, it just was so much room, and then the crushed velour seating, I loved it. And now, 
Let me show you some kind of a car. This old Cutlass Supreme. I've driven it. And I tell you, it can really make you feel drive happy. They call it the little limousine because it's got a lot of great things. And this year they got the new Landar roof you can order. And the ride. You think you're driving a bigger car. And man, does it handle. I'd even like to scout in it. Why don't you check out the new old Cutlass Supreme? Hey, Willie, what are you driving? My first three cars were Cutlasses. I had the 1982, I had the 1983, and then I also had the 1985 four-door. Um, basically, what I would do is I always had to get duals put on my car. I always had to get rims. Um, I changed the sound system. I would have like either an Alpine or a Kenwood. I would have the six by nines, um, the twelves in the trunk, and um, yeah, kept it clean all the time. All yeah. The time. <laughs> like gold itself, there's a car with a tradition of being an investment. Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme for 1983. If you'd bought a new 1979 Cutlass Supreme Coupe with a standard engine, chances are you could sell it today and get back about 90% of what you paid. Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme, historically a golden investment. Oldsmobile! Have one built for you. One of my first cars was a new Probe. Uh, it, was, it was something back then. It might not seem like much now. When it came out, it was like having a Corvette. I was 18 years old. It was brand new. Uh, I took my girlfriend, who's my wife now, to the prom in it. And, you know, we were like stars uh, with this car. Even older guys would pulled me over and wanted to see the features. It had uh, new features. It was like a concept car. This is the new Probe. Not too long ago, it existed only as an experimental model at Ford. A prototype for auto shows, a car out of the future. But this is the year you get to stop looking at it and actually drive it. You can even take one home. The Probe from Ford. It's hard to believe it's really here. I had a 1979 uh, Trans Am, and I, uh, that car was bad. It was a hot rod. It had a 400 engine in it with a, a double carburetor, double Holly carburetor. It was so fast, it felt like I was in an airplane. Pontiac introduces the first turbocharged V8 of the 80s. Available only in Trans Am or Formula Firebird. With power swelling out of the hood and telling the world where it's at. A 4.9 liter message of appreciation to true believers. The way Pontiac knows how to deliver it. The world's only turbocharged V8 available in a production car. Now that's more Pontiac excitement for the great ones. GM has very, very nice cars. I think growing up as a Chrysler child and driving Ford cars, I always kind of pushed them off to the side, but everyone can always appreciate a good Cadillac. My great-grandma had a Cadillac DeVille. I think it might have been like 79 or 80. Um, and it would have the, like the seat in the middle. So like, you know where your console is now, you could just lift that up and it would be a seat. And I mean, I could be the only one in the car with her and I would still like sit in that seat. Like that was my seat growing up. And I mean, even I just talking about it, I can like remember the smell of the car and like how the door handles looked and stuff like that. Like I used to think it was a limo. I'd be like, I'm riding this style. I'm only five years old. I'm in the limo. What y'all riding in? My great grandmother, she had a 1984 Cadillac with the, it was blue with the beige rag top and the inside had like all wood grain interior. And I was just hoping that I was gonna get that car when I turned like 17. But that was like one of my first favorite cars. I don't know the year, but my dad had a, um, a Camaro. Before they brought it back, he had a Camaro, 
and he used to take take us to school and that and I used to hate having to open you know step and get in the in the back you know pull the pull this front seat up squeeze into the back we sit in the Camaro I don't just beat him I rock him I don't just drive I drive a Chevy. I would always be like, that's my car, you know, that's my car. And so now, now that I'm grown, I don't say that's my car, that's my car. If we drive past like an all white Wrangler, I say, who parked my Wrangler right here? I told valet not to park it here. You know, <laughs> I remember playing that's my car as a kid and picking the cars we wish to have. So I really like seeing that sweet Iraq Camaro from back in the day. It was so amazing to see just how far we've come through the years with technology changes. Now, we have autonomous cars that drive themselves. I grew up loving cars. I used to build model cars. I actually went to college. I went to Center for Creative Studies. You know, I was in their industrial design program. Some of my classmates to this day, they, um, they're some of the top car designers. They were teachers that I had at uh, Center for Creative Studies that, you know, designed cars like the Charger, the, the original one, and designed the original Camaro and Corvette, and they would be telling us, you know, what they were thinking at the time they created it or, you know, naming some of the design features that, that they literally personally put into these cars. Cars meant everything here in Detroit because you, any car that was pretty much made, we had it here. So a lot, I'm sure in other places, they probably had never seen certain cars, but we, we, see, we, we would see them all. Whether you like the, the fast cars, the muscle cars, the luxury cars, um, it's just a part of our culture. Just like our shoes and our clothes. Um, cars is, is a part of our culture. It was like a car show here, like every, everywhere you went, you know, some cars had ground effects, some simulated rims. I mean, we, I think we took custom cars to a whole different level. We were probably the first people to, to even get into custom cars here in Detroit because we just, we had it like that. Like I remember growing up, especially like being on the east side and going to Belle Isle, it was a car show every summer, like, People had spinners, they had neon lights, they blasting music out the trunk of their car, just, you know, and to me that's normal, but you know, when I have cousins come into town, they're like, what is this? Like, it's just a car show. It was just all about cars, you know, um, the old school cutlasses, uh, the, the hydraulics and the rims, and just seeing people ride around, uh, racing, things of that nature. It was a, it was a car city, yeah. I started driving um, late. I started, I got my first car when I was pretty much almost, you know, my last year of college. You know, I had friends who were, who've been driving like before even the road tests and all of that stuff, before you even 16, I'm talking about 14, 10 year old, you learn how to, <laughs> you learn how to drive when you like 10 years old. I am a Detroit girl and I know everything about cars, okay? I could literally look at the tail lights of any car that is driving down the lodge and tell you what kind of car it is. My ultimate favorite car that I've always wanted is a Mustang. I want a white Mustang drop top, like souped up Mustang. Yeah, I think growing up in Detroit um, made me love cars because 
I mean, all my uncles, they, they like my grandma, she had the, the Cadillac. My uncle had like a 1960 something gold Eldorado Cadillac. Like all my uncles always had nice American cars, you know, so yeah, I've, I've always liked cars. And I think that is because I'm a true Detroiter. Yeah. Detroit is definitely the Motor City and we will always be the Motor City no matter how much time has passed because it's just something that we pass down, you know, from generation to generation. People work hard and these are the fruits of their labors that they're able to appreciate and even their children are able to appreciate. It's just definitely a deep-seated love for cars if you're from Detroit. I'm glad you could join me to take a look back at those classic cars produced in the D. Thanks so much for watching, and come on back again. Yeah, I like, I like that, because that's like doing a Diddy version of, like, you know, GB producing. <laughs>